All right, let's begin again in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as I said in our services this morning, there is a great shakening that is happening, but many people can't see what God is doing. And if you don't, if you don't seek God in this hour, you're going to get confused in some cases. And a spirit of deception is literally upon the world right now. The spirit of Antichrist is absolutely being manifested in different arenas. And even God's people are basically not awake to what God is doing because God is chastening His people right now. He's purging His church so that we can bring forth a great harvest, so we can bring forth fruit in these last of the last days. And so I want to encourage you, no matter what things look like on the outside, God is working behind the scenes in a mighty way. We are in the beginning. I honestly believe the Lord has told me this and is showing me that we're in the beginning of what really could be a third great awakening and the devil is panicking and he is creating counterfeits to this great awakening. The woke movement is a counterfeit to the great awakening of God's people to who they are and their purpose in this earth. And so I want to encourage you to be married to Jesus in these last days, to be loyal to Jesus, to be committed to Jesus unto death. And many times in this country, we are, we are not asked to give our physical lives in persecution for righteousness and for the kingdom's sake. But we certainly are asked to compromise on every front the Word of God, compromise our integrity, compromise our loyalty to Jesus. And I just want to encourage you above all things to be faithful to Jesus. And if you're faithful to Jesus, you're going to be faithful to His Word. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I told you to do, Jesus said. So we are seeing God separating sheep from goats in this hour. We're seeing God separating and calling us out. He has said, come out from among them. We have to be willing to be rejected. We have to be willing to, to be persecuted. We have to be willing to to be mocked for our love for Jesus and for our commitment to His kingdom that is an eternal kingdom. And sad to say, many churches are simply not prepared for the shakening that's happening right now. And so I want to be just a, a small voice perhaps in your life for a short season to encourage you to pour yourself into your identification with Christ. Make sure you know who you are, what you have, and what you can do in Jesus that's been provided by grace. And it is grace that has made us who we are. It is grace that is empowering us to be what God's called us to be in this hour. And so I'm, I'm encouraging you to embrace grace in your life, even, even as we have sung these again, beautiful songs. I'm telling you, the worship is just over the top. I, I just want to commend the team. I want to commend our brother uh, that leads. Just truly, we talked about over lunch today, cultural differences. And no matter what the cultural difference is in, in the style of music, the Holy Ghost in it's the same. The anointing's the same. The peace and the joy and the righteousness of it is the same in the Holy Spirit. And I really sense the Holy Spirit in your worship. And you can't pull that off twice in a row. You might have pulled it off this morning, but... Now it's authentic. I, I sense God and a move of God. And so do not despise small beginnings. God has great things and powerful, mighty things for them that will be loyal to Him in these last days. People are married to everything but Jesus, it seems like, even in the church. And I have to deal with things in the natural world just like you have to. And there's a lot of things in this world that are absolutely messed up. Somebody asked me again the other day, what's the world coming to? It's coming to an end. That's what it's coming to is an end. Her days are numbered. And the kingdom of God is what will endure forever and ever. And so in that kingdom, 
we've seen that we are a new creation. That if you've been born again, something radical has happened to you on the inside of you and that you are in your spirit united to Jesus himself. And he has declared himself to be the head of the church, which is his body. We are the body of the Lord Jesus Christ in this earth. And we are to, again, be loyal to him and to his kingdom. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, let's look at this in our identity again. Because remember, your identity affects your purpose in life. If you don't know who you are, and if you, if you establish an identity after the flesh, then you're going to experience great defeat in this world and discouragement in this world because your new identity is in Christ. And that's in your spirit. It's in your inner man. And you and I are the first fruits of God's new creation. We are God's new creation. Jesus is the gardener of God's field, his new creation, and we're headed toward a new heaven and a new earth wherein nothing but righteousness will dwell. Amen. Amen. All of the injustices are going to be dealt with and balanced out at the appearing of Jesus. All the evil is going to be eradicated. All the sickness and disease and pain and evil and darkness is absolutely going to be totally eradicated like a cancer from this world and Jesus is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And we're the first fruits of that in our relationship with him. Now, we are God's new creation. Amen. Amen. And in that new creation, there is a unity that we have as the body of Christ that has nothing to do with our flesh and the promoting of our flesh or the establishing of flesh or putting confidence in our flesh. And yet the world is dominated right now with nothing but flesh. And the church is confused at large with even who we are. And how do we, how do we identify? As I said this morning, one of the most popular things and trends that's happening in our culture that is very destructive is being asked now, how do you identify? And you'd be shocked at how people identify. And I'm here to tell you, any one of you can ask me at any time, how do I identify? I identify as a new creation in Christ Jesus. I am the head, not the tail. I am above and not beneath. I am the seed of Abraham. I am an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And on and on, I could go all day long if you'd sit there. So don't ask me, how do I identify? Because you can ask most people, how do you identify? And, and they will identify who they are in something usually of this world and after the flesh. And they wonder why they're depressed. And they wonder why they're discouraged. And they wonder why things are just such a struggle. Until you identify by faith with Christ, you're not going to understand the kingdom of God and all the wonderful things that Jesus has provided and done for us that are a reality in your spirit, man. In 2 Corinthians, we'll start in verse 14 for the sake of time. I, I, I went a little further up last, last session, but for the love of Christ compels us. Now, I'm in the new King James, and I told the, the media I would do King James. So let's change this over here. For the love of Christ constrains us. I'm asked all the time because I minister on grace. It's one of my primary messages Jesus has given me is if you don't preach the law and you don't condemn people over sin, what's going to keep them from sinning? And that is a sure sign that we don't know who we are. It's a sure sign we don't understand this new creation and how that I don't want to sin, not because I'm afraid God's going to be angry at me or punish me. I don't want to sin anymore. Because I love God and I love you. Because one of these days, especially I believe in this third great awakening that we're on the brink of, we're going to wake up and we're going to realize all this sin is not only self-destructive, sin hurts other people. The reason God wants me to quit sinning 
is he doesn't want me to work any ill will towards you. I had a man one time, I need to hurry, bless my heart. But I had a man one time, he, he was uh, in an affair, and he was trying to convince me that this was God. And he knew better, he knew me pretty well, uh, and sure enough, he, he knew me well enough to know, you're not going to persuade me, this is God. This is sin, this is wrong. I love you and God loves you, but this is sin. And he kept saying, but you don't understand I love her. And you don't understand she loves me. And so I need to cut this story short, but I'm trying to figure out how do I reach him? Because we're just going to keep going back and forth and nothing's going to change. And I want to see him change. So I decided I would agree with him. And it just shocked him. He said, you don't understand, Pastor. I just love this woman. And I said, you know what? I do understand. I agree. I believe you love her. Well, he just, he was stunned. It's like, he'd listen to so much of my teaching, it's like there's no way he's going to compromise. <laughs> and so he didn't understand. And I said, I believe you love her with all your heart. I believe she loves you. But let me ask you a question. Do you love her husband? Do you love her children? Do you love our church? Do you love me? Because you look me in the eye and you tell me you love me, but you're breaking my heart on what you're about to do to your precious wife and your lovely, beautiful children. It's one thing to say, I love someone in sin. It's another thing to understand the love of God that works no ill toward its neighbor. How do you know when you're walking in love? Because that's your mission statement. Love never works ill toward its neighbor. Why am I not going to steal your stuff? Not because it's wrong. It is wrong. Not because it's immoral. It is immoral. Why am I not going to steal any of your stuff? Because that works ill towards you. That is not love. And what the world calls love today is absolutely destructive. It's perversion. And it's a cancer even in the church where even many of us pastors are confused and we don't know how to explain to people at large the love of God that is what constrains us. Thank you for that. Thunderous applause. No, no, no. That's a welfare clap. I don't want it. If I can't earn it, I don't want it. Paul says God's love. I'll take that one. That one, came, that one came from the heart. Paul is saying, look, it's God's love that constrains me. The reason I'm not going to sleep with my neighbor's wife is I have the love of God shed abroad now in my heart. I'm not going to steal your stuff. I'm not going to bear false witness against you. That permeates our culture. And yet... We, at large, haven't understood the great love that God has for us, and thereby now our love one for another that constrains us. Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And he, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. There is a place in Christianity and in this new birth and being born again where we're not here any longer living for ourselves and selfish gain, but we're living for another man. And I, I love you, but there's only one man on not only this planet, but in this universe that died for all your sins and saved you from an eternity in a devil's hell. And that's Jesus Christ, worthy of all of our praise and all of our glory. He says then in verse 16, wherefore, because Jesus died for us all and we're all dead. We died to something, but we're alive unto him now. Wherefore, or therefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Know we him no more what? After the flesh. None of us know Jesus after the flesh. None of us love Jesus after the flesh. None of us are loyal to Jesus after the flesh. But yet I took a poll this morning 
And everybody raised their hand that they knew Jesus. Well, how do we know Jesus? We know Jesus after the Spirit and after the Word of God. I need an amen. amen. We know Jesus. How do we know Him? After the Spirit and after the Word of God. I'm going to say something here that sets people back. It is actually easy for, easier for us to be loyal to Jesus and to know Him now, not after the flesh, but after the Spirit and after the Word, than it was for the apostles. I used to be pretty hard on the apostles in my own heart about how in the world could they be as slow as they were. <laughs> have you read the Gospels? Have you, have you watched Jesus' life working with these ten deadheads? I mean, it was just a, or 12. I'm not real bright either, so don't misunderstand. One other reason not to be too critical, amen. But these 12 guys just were slow, and it's like Jesus would, would do these miracles, and then they would just, like, forget it the next day. And even after he was raised from the dead, and he shows up among them, and they're touching him, and, and, and it says, and many of them did not believe. They knew him after the flesh. And it was difficult for them to, at times to really wrap their minds around, this is God. Because he got tired. God doesn't get tired. He slept. God doesn't sleep or slumber. He got hungry. Amen. Amen. God so perfectly entered into humanity, I get amazed at us as the people of God how few of us really believe Jesus was God made flesh. He really was a man, a human being, just like we are, yet without sin. And so they struggled because they saw Him after the flesh. They knew Him after the flesh. Paul says there was one time we knew Jesus after the flesh, but... Henceforth know we Him no more. Know we Him no more what? After the flesh. We know Him after the Holy Spirit. He's the one that reveals Jesus to us and the Word of God. And the reason you have to get that is because you are to no longer know yourselves after the flesh or one another after the flesh. So how am I supposed to know myself now? After the Holy Spirit and after the Word of God. The Word of God is where I discover who I am. I don't discover who I am in politics. Boy, that, that is the car running? I'm telling you, I love you, but people are married to their politics, and you want to offend people quick, just say politics. Because they're married to politics. And while we need to be political, we don't even know what healthy politics is, I believe, anymore with how we're going to relate in a civil way one to another in a fallen world. Politics is important, but people become so political that you can't reach them with explaining to them who the Bible says they are because politics wants to give us a false identity. Politicians use identity politics to split us all up, to divide us all, to hurt us literally, to enslave us to the systems. And so God wants us to understand politics, yes, but in being married to Jesus, I'm not going to let anybody in politics or college professors, many of you are in college that are here, and I commend you for furthering your education, but on these college campuses, they will try to get you to identify with something besides Jesus. Anything but Jesus. Because if they can get you to identify with things after the flesh, they can bring destruction into your life. And this is why church is so important. This is why the Word is so important. And we have to gather together and forsake not the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is as we see the day approaching. Because the day is approaching where Jesus is going to come back and He's going to judge this world in righteousness. All this stuff is going to be burned up that's after the flesh. And so we have to know ourselves now after the Spirit with a new identification in Christ. 
in Christ. We have to see ourselves. I could, I could spend hours explaining all of the inferiorities in my life, all of the complexes, all of the anger in my life, all of the jealousy. I could just, I could go to Galatians chapter 5 and show you the works of the flesh and the list. And they were, they were, they were in my life. And it was because I only knew myself after the flesh. I only saw myself after the flesh. I only identified with my flesh. No one taught me even I had a spirit and that I have a new identification in my spirit with Jesus and with His church. I'm identified with Jesus and His body. That's my new identification, the new creation. That's what he goes on to say in the next verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. One translation says a new person altogether. One translation says a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I explained that this morning. When you get born again, Nothing passes away in your flesh and nothing becomes new. A part of your flesh is your unrenewed mind. Romans chapter 8 connects the carnal mind to your flesh. Your flesh is not just your body. That's a part of your flesh. Your flesh is your carnal, unrenewed mind. And Romans chapter 8 says to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Why is there not any more life and peace? I'm telling you what you have now, if you can bottle it and maintain it, there could be 20,000 people experiencing what we experienced this morning and this evening of real life, life in Christ, life in His kingdom, a joy that has nothing to do with this world, a love that's not of the world, that's not for the world, but it's a love for God and a love now, a genuine love, one for, one for another. That comes through identification with Christ, not the flesh. And this offends people. And I just love you. And I want to leave here on a good note. So I'm doing my best to navigate troubled waters and to go where angels dare tread. Because people are proud of their flesh. They glory in their flesh. They promote their flesh. They think again, they're USDA choice flesh. They're better flesh than other flesh. And the truth is, none of us are any good after the flesh. People want to believe they're better in their flesh than other people in their flesh. But the Bible teaches us, there is no good thing in me, Romans 7, 18. That is to say, my flesh. Philippians chapter 2, Paul says, I put no confidence in the flesh. We either believe that or we don't. I'm telling you, the world does it. And the carnal mindset of the world is all about flesh. And God is all about spirit. Jesus said, the flesh profits you nothing, John 6, 63. It's the spirit that quickens. It's the spirit that makes alive. What we felt was spirit and life. What you can have in your life, regardless of who you are after the flesh or where you've come from after the flesh, we can all have the kingdom of God and all the blessings and promises in the kingdom of God after the spirit. Amen. Amen. It's supposed to be good news. Yes. And so look down real quick. Uh, he goes on to say, in, in verse, in verse uh, 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us, everybody say us, us, to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, everybody say us, us. the ministry of reconciliation. Now when you get born again, all things are not of God in your flesh. All things are not of God in your carnal, unrenewed mind. I used to say you're dumb head. But I found that people are so proud of their dumb heads that it offends them. 
when you say dumb head. And yet we think we're pretty smart. That's called flesh. It's called pride. And the, the smartest day you'll have in eternity is the day you realize without God, you're not very smart. Your carnal mind is an enmity against God. It's not subject to God, neither indeed can be. That's why anytime the Holy Spirit's working and true revelation starts coming forward, somebody's going to get offended because not everybody's in their spiritual mind right now. And when we're smaller like this, you can almost do it. We're close. Nobody's gotten up mad. Nobody's... Give me time. I got so blessed by our brother's pants. I, I, was, I was trying to be cutting edge and I put all this color. I had this much color. I mean, it is so cool the diversity that God has placed within every human being but the unity of the Spirit that we have and the Word of God. And the, it's amazing to me that everywhere I go, you've got different personalities, you've got different likes, different dislikes, different talents, different, different, different. And we live in a world that's trying to make us all the same and no longer celebrate diversity. But I'm here to tell you the true and living God, the God that is the God of all gods who are no gods, the Lord Jesus Christ, has created a body of believers with all this beautiful diversity that have this common identity that is of our spirit that brings about the kingdom of God in beautiful display, beautiful colors. And I'm so excited to see what I'm seeing in the body of Christ. While I see the challenges, while I see difficult times are ahead, I see the church truly being purged. Judgment begins at the house of God. And God could not judge Egypt even in the delivering of His people, Israel, ancient Israel, without judging His people too. And there came a point that Israel repented and the plagues quit coming on them. And it only came on Egypt. And God divided light from darkness. And while darkness covered the land, there was light in Goshen. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, the darkness is covering this planet, but there will be light coming out of Goshen. The people of God. Because we identify with Christ. And we refuse to allow the world to give us a false or an imposed or a fallen identity. And many of our young people are being challenged today. And identities... Fallen identities, false identities, imposed identities are being pushed on them. And the church has to be a counter voice of sanity in a world that right now is insane. And we have to identify with Christ. Look, at, look, look down at, at verse 21 of that same chapter. For He, that's God, hath made Him, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Your new identity after Christ is righteous and truly holy. I don't care who you are, where you've come from, what your past is. You fill in all the blanks. If you know Jesus, if you've accepted Jesus, he was made sin with your very sin so you can now be made righteous with His very righteousness. That's your new identification. That's who you are. He identified with us and our sin without sinning. That's important. Jesus did not sin to be made sin on the cross. But He was made sin on the cross. Whose sin was He made sin with? Your sin and my sin. He bore all your sins. All my sins. I wish I could teach. I don't want to create purposely any kind of confusion. I don't know 
where you're at as a church in your understanding of, of righteousness and, and God's righteousness, of forgiveness of sin. I hear people talk about sin today, and I, I just am so perplexed. Do, have we even heard the gospel? Do we understand? We have been forgiven. You have been forgiven of all past sin, present sins, because none of us are perfect after the flesh right now, and future tense sins. Y'all believe that? Yes. That is awesome. That's the gospel. Jesus didn't die for some of our sins. And we got to pay for the ones he didn't die for. Jesus died for all my sins. Past tense, present tense, and future. I'm a forgiven man. Yeah, but you're this or you're that. or you're, On and on it goes with the world attacking now everybody. And I'm going, what are y'all talking about? I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Amen. I was falsely accused recently of... Boy, don't say that, Dwayne. Praise God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. People are crazy. How do I say that? I got news for you. I am a person of privilege. I got even better news for you. You are a person of privilege if you know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you are the most privileged human being on the planet. You have fallen heir of God. Yes. How'd you like to wake up in the morning and your parents... Well, that didn't, that didn't come out right. I was going to say, how would you like to wake up in the morning and your parents are dead and now you inherited everything? <laughs> but that might tempt some of you to really rejoice. So that didn't come out right, but... I did it anyway, didn't I? <laughs> A man died and left a will. It's called the New Testament, the new will. And he's the only person that's ever died that left a will for his family and was raised from the dead to make sure the will is properly executed and that the devil can't steal your prosperity. He can't steal your blessings. You have to give them up. You have to forfeit all the good things God has given you through the deceptions of this world. Instead of fighting the good fight of faith and realizing I am so identified with Jesus, I am blessed. I'm not trying to get blessed. There's nothing that can happen where I can become more blessed. I am blessed through my identification with Christ. And nobody can take that away. I'm prosperous. I woke up one day after making Jesus the Lord of my life and I became an heir. See, you think of an heir of a piece of property. You became an heir of a, of a piece of land. Let's say you became an heir of a million dollar corporation. That would excite you. What if you woke up one day and somebody told you, you are an heir of God. God. When that is a reality by the Spirit in Revelation, it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. And it all comes by my faith in Jesus, God's grace, not my race. I am who I am, not by race. I am who I am by grace. And you are who you are, not by race, but by grace. And we sing it, we preach it, but then when I come along and say it, people get mad. <laughs> There's nothing to get mad about. We are blessed. We are happy, fortunate to be envied Amen. as the people, the people of God. You are, you are declared in God's eyes righteous and truly holy, and none of us are perfect after the flesh. Did you, I wish I had time to, to massage this, but when he said Jesus was made sin without sinning, why can't you see that you could be made righteous now without works? If Jesus can be made sin with my sin without sinning, how come I can't be made righteous with His very righteousness without works? Amen. You can be. You are. Yes. The righteousness you have, listen, is a righteousness that has never known sin. Amen. Jesus never sinned. And you've been given His righteousness. And if that doesn't excite you, you're just mean. Something's bad wrong with you. Something's twisted. 
<laughs> that didn't come out good either, but people are just twisted. It's like, what happened to you? Who, who dropped you at birth? You, don't you know what happened to you when you got saved? I'm telling you, people don't have any idea. They think Christianity is just joining a church or they think Christianity is just, well, I'm going to try to do better and live a good life. No, this thing is radical. This thing, this thing is a new creation. This thing is Jesus so identified with our humanity so we can now identify with His deity. You are one spirit with the Lord. And you're having a bad day. We're having a bad day because we haven't renewed our minds to who we are. Go over to Galatians chapter 3. I am about to. Galatians chapter 3. Let me, let me do this quickly. I, I got a revelation supernaturally in 1980. I had an open vision of the cross. And in this vision... I saw myself inside of Jesus. I saw Jesus on the cross. I can't tell you what he looked like, but I knew it was Jesus on the cross. But I saw me on the inside of him. And I saw God's wrath come on him for all my sins. And when he died on the cross, I saw me die in him. Then... I saw him taken off of the cross and put in the tomb and I was in him when he was buried. Then I saw him raised from the dead. In my book, Identity Theft, I go into detail on this vision. And one of the things that was a mystery, I literally saw him descend after he died and I died in him and he was buried and I was buried. I literally saw him descend into the lower parts of the earth and God put his hand over my, over my spiritual eyes and I couldn't see what happened to him. And, and it wasn't until looking back that I began to realize no man could comprehend, no man could, could handle in our humanity what Jesus did for you. The death he really died the pains of death that he took. His physical death was terrible. I'm not minimizing that. But his physical death was nothing compared to him crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus embraced your sins and God's wrath for all your sins. And it's like he put his hand over me, over my eyes. And then I saw him come out of the tomb. And listen, I saw me inside of him, but it was a different me. Amen. Then I saw him ascend into heaven, and I ascended. Then I saw him seated on a throne, and I was on the inside of him, seated on the throne, ruling and reigning. Now listen to me. That Yeah, I got... Uh, 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 uh. I, want, I want my brother to teach me his dance. I got, I got to learn that dance. I do. I like it. I like it. I like it. I'm about to dance and embarrass my kids. <laughs> what the real mystery and miracle was, I had no idea what I saw. I had no idea it was in the Bible. And so I had to get in the Bible for myself because anybody can have a vision of anything and a lot of cults have been started out of a false vision of even an angel talking to him. So just because I had a vision, and I'm telling you, it was a vision of visions, I needed to know, is this God? And it shocked me how the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life I live in this flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I couldn't believe it when I read Romans chapter 6 that we've been baptized with Him into His death. And then you go over into Ephesians chapter 2 and it talks about how we've been raised together 
with Christ. And then you get into Romans chapter 8 and you find out that we're seated with Him and ruling and reigning in this life. And yet people have no concept. The world has so conformed us. The world has so misinformed us that we've lost our identity. And we don't realize we're to be nothing like them. We're to sound nothing like them. We're to take them this good news of you are identifying with nothing but your flesh. And if you live after the flesh, you will die. But you can mortify now the deeds of your flesh and live a life of prosperity and blessings and joy and love and kindness. And don't make me preach. The Bible says that the fruit of the Spirit are all these good things. Well, once we begin to see who we are in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit begins to just be produced in our lives. Real quick, after I saw that, nothing in my body changed. And nothing in my dumb head changed. So, in my search and discovery... I discovered three identities that dominate every one of us that have to be dealt with. And I, again, I, I need to hurry through this. I want to say it because I think, it, I think it's important. What am I doing? Is it me? Do I just, I, I can't just stand still. I just can't stand still. Okay, you can hear me still. Let me give you quick three identities we all have to come to grips with. Number one, we have a short-term identity. All of us have a short-term identity that comes from your family. Every one of us were born into a family and we have genetic identities, things that just are a part of being in that family. I mean, I don't know about you how long you've paid attention, but you can, you can see a guy walk through the door and, I mean, he just walks kind of like this or something and, and then three little kids will walk through the door and they're all... <laughs> you, you meet some people and it's the, it's the Smith family and you meet... You meet Mr. Smith, and he's got a big old honker. And then you meet his kids, and I mean, bless their heart. They had a little bitty head and a big old honker. It's genetic. It's an identity. It's just a carnal identity. You didn't choose the color of your skin. That's genetic. You didn't, co you didn't choose the color of your eyes. That's genetic. See, that makes up an identity that is real. We are human beings and we all have a family that has goofed us up. Y'all didn't like that. I get it. And so how do I deal with that? Well, I wish I had more time, but psychological identities are formed in family units. Psychological identities are formed in family units. In my family, I had a psychological identity of poverty drilled into me. We were poor. I mean, we were very, very poor. And that identity with poverty was so strong in my family and generational. My, my grandfather was a moonshiner in the Carolinas. And that's how he made a living taking care of 10 kids. My grandmother was full-blooded Indian and she literally lived on a, a plantation where it was share crop holders and they got part of the profits of picking cotton and that's what she did. She picked cotton on a plantation and my grandfather was a moonshiner that got killed by the feds. Yeah. Call 911. Hallelujah. Amen. This is bad. And so you can imagine he gets killed by the feds. She has 10 kids and the poverty and alcohol. Everybody was an alcoholic in the family. Well, I could say a lot of things. The people are trying to discover who they are after the flesh. And even family trees have become popular. Let's, let's, let's look at our family tree and let's, let's run down our family tree. Well, my family tree was the Charlie Brown tree. It's horrible. 
all of my relatives were either murderers in jail or alcoholics and poor. There was no, I was the first person as far as you can go back to go to college. And the only reason I got to go to college is I, I had a, a skill set and could play tennis, discovered it in my senior year. And I made it, I made it to college, a two year school. And then I, then I made it to a four year school and I was going to go professional in tennis, but I got a good education, not because of finances, but because of that gift and, and just a, a, a blessing. And so poverty was so ingrained on the inside of me and it was so generational. It's who we were. We're all poor. And I can remember talking about wanting to do better my life and everybody in my family got mad at me. It's like, who do you think you are? You go to college now and you just think you're something. <laughs> See, for me to break out of poverty would make them look bad. I said a whole lot without saying it. For me to break out of poverty and that identity with poverty, that psychological identity would make everybody else look bad. So they wanted me to be poor. Poverty was a badge of honor. We're not like them rich folk. In more ways than one, we were not like them. You'd be surprised how many psychological identities people carry their whole life that are totally contrary to who you are in Christ. And the only way those psychological identities can be broken is if you believe in the new identity you have in Christ. I broke it. I not only broke it with my new identity, I broke it generationally. I broke it generationally. All four of my children are experiencing a level of prosperity that, that we only dreamed of. My grandchildren don't understand poverty like I grew up in. I had a good talk with my son recently, and now we have to make sure we teach our grandchildren um, thanksgiving and appreciation and the value of things. Many times if you grow up poor, you just have a, a character built on the inside of you where you really value things better. You appreciate things more. You're more thankful. Man, you grow up, I mean, you grow up and, and you've never been hungry, really hungry. You don't appreciate food. So we have to literally, we, we'll, we'll take a vacation with the kids. We just take a vacation, go back to where I used to live and show them the house I grew up in. And it freaks them out. It would freak them out. Every, every two or three years, we just say, that's where we were born. That's where I was born. One time we were in the street all of us bailed out of the car and we're looking at the house and, and the kids are going, you couldn't have grown up there. There's just no way. It's like they're starting to cry. And this lady walks out and she goes, can I help you all? And, and it was rude of us. You don't stop in front of somebody's house and unload the car. So we weren't. I mean, I, di I didn't blame her for being short with me. But she goes, can I help you all? Like we were going to rob them or something. And, uh, and I said, no, ma'am. She said, I said, I just wanted to show my kids I grew up here. And she went, I am so, so sorry. <laughs> I don't care who you are. You've got some short-term identity issues that you're going to have to deal with. And you had no control over your short-term identity. No control. The only thing you can control now is overcoming it with your new identity. The, the second identity that we all have is long-term identity in Adam. All of us came out of a drunken sailor in Adam. Sorry, I'm in a hurry. Uh, Noah. It'll hit you later. <laughs> Just let that sink in. Again, I tell young people all the time, okay, you want to trace your roots? Good deal. Let's do it. Okay, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. And they'll go back so far. And I say, what are you doing? Well, well, I'm tracing my roots. No, you're not. Your roots go back further. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. We all are going to end up at Noah and three boys. And if you keep going, we're all going to end up in the garden in Adam. We all came out of Adam. The whole human race was on the inside of Adam. Adam came from the dirt. There's five primary differences in dirt. You've got white dirt, sand. You've got red dirt, clay. 
got black dirt, rich soil, dirt. Adam came from dirt. The whole, whole human race came out of Adam. And we all have to deal with how we all inherited sin. We all were born into sin, not because we sinned, but because of Adam's sin. Well, I'm not getting any response here all of a sudden. We all go back to Adam, the family of man. Then the third identity that overcomes all of it, trumps all of it, is our new identity in Christ. The only way you can overcome short-term identity, the only way is through faith in Jesus Christ. The only way you can overcome your long-term identity in Adam, in Adam all have sinned. In Adam, all are judged. In Adam, all are condemned. All of us. The only way you can overcome that is faith in Jesus Christ. Because what the first man did wrong and messed up, the second man, the last Adam, has done it right and made it right by God's amazing grace. You're either in the family of God or you're in the Adam's family. Remember those guys? They thought everybody else was nuts. They thought everybody else was ugly. They thought everybody else was messed up. I used to love that show. Because these are the ugliest messed up people on the planet, but everybody else is ugly and messed up. The one, the one girl that was so pretty, they were rejecting her. She was so ugly. See, the world thinks we're nuts. Because we don't buy into all this psychobabble and we don't buy into all these perversions and we don't buy into all this immorality and we don't buy into all this lack of love paraded around as love. We now have been adopted into the family of God. We're no longer in the Adams family. We've been made free in the family of God. Hallelujah. In the family of God. Let me show you who you are quickly here. Galatians chapter 3. Verse 24, for the sake of time. Verse 24. We'll start right there. You can, you can jump in here just about anywhere. But Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we're no longer under the schoolmaster. Verse 26. For you are all the children of God... By faith in Christ Jesus. What makes us God's children? Faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. Can you see your identification there? You've been literally baptized into Jesus and put on Jesus. And I wish we could do it physically. I, I, I know that when Jesus comes back, Things are going to be so radically changed, it's just going to blow our minds how God is going to make everything right. And as He originally intended, and we will look different. We will think different. We will be so different. But until then, we walk by faith and not by sight. For as many as of you as have been baptized into Christ, you put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, Male nor female. Now let me just ask a, a controversial quick question. Does everybody still understand they're still boys and girls? Does everybody understand it's okay to have a boy's room? And a girl's room? And that that's not a lack of love? I literally made some statements a couple of years ago trying to explain this in my own church. And there were some people got offended at me. Because they thought I was discriminating. They thought I was being mean to somebody struggling in their, in their gender or their identity is what they're really struggling with. We've gotten so deluded by the world, we forgot. One of the reasons we have separate bathrooms is we're protecting our children from predators. Perverts. Oh yeah, I said it. There's predators. I'm not saying you. I'm talking about visitors that didn't come. <laughs> now, while there still is male and female in a short-term identity, 
The scriptures say here there's neither... So what's he talking about? He's talking about we never now let Jew or Gentile separate us. We never let bond or free separate us. Poor or rich separate us. Male or female separate us. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Do you realize, dear ones, we are Abraham's seed? And it has nothing to do with our flesh. The Jews thought they were special because of their flesh. And this is what Paul fought. This is what the early church had to fight. Was this division between Jew and Gentile, circumcised and uncircumcised. And the Scriptures teach in this same book of Galatians that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything but faith now that worketh by love. And this same book in chapter 6 says that we shouldn't be glorying in anything but the cross and that when we glory in the cross, we realize that neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth but a new creation. What he's saying is our new identity is not defined by our gender. Our new identity is not defined by anything after the flesh. Our new identity is defined by Christ. And I'm telling you what, I'm the seed of Abraham. Amen. You're the seed of Abraham. Amen. And I struggle with poverty. One of the ways that I don't mean to be offensive, but I'm trying to be real and transparent. But one of the ways I overcame poverty was with this scripture that, wait a minute, if I'm the seed of Abraham, I'm supposed to be rich. Yes. The Bible doesn't say he was rich. It said he was very rich. And you'll never find a Jew on this planet you can convince that it's God's will to be poor. And I don't mean that derogatory toward the Jewish people. I'm just saying I've never met a Jew that believes God wants me poor. Well, I am a Jew, not after the flesh and circumcision of the flesh, but Romans chapter 1 says, your heart has been circumcised and you are a Jew inwardly and that now you are the seed of Abraham. Amen. Man, we ought to be having a Jericho march. Amen. Pulling down strongholds instead of statues. I'm sorry, it slipped. I believe we need to pull some things down, no doubt. But we need, to, we need to cast these strongholds down. And we need to renew our minds to the new creation and who we are. Because it's a reality in here. And, he, and, and I don't have time to explain. You don't always feel it. You don't always feel like an heir of God. You don't even get in contact with God with your emotions. God will affect our emotions, but that's not how you contact God is with your emotions. You contact God and you connect to God by faith. You don't connect with God based on your intellect. I'm not saying we don't commune with God intellectually. I'm saying I don't connect to God on the basis of philosophy and intellect. I connect by faith. Go to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and... Yep, I'm going to cut it a little shorter than I was going to cut short. Man, I got two good things that I really need to deposit. Everybody okay? Yes. Let, me, let me cut this fifth chapter short. He's comparing what happened to Adam and how it affected us to what happened to Jesus, the second man, the last Adam. The Bible calls Jesus the second man, the last Adam. There were billions of men born after the first Adam. So why is Jesus called the second man? Adam was a representative man. And listen, the whole human race was on the inside of him. And where he went, we went. Jesus is the second man, the last Adam, because we were all on the inside of him. And where he went, we went. Amen. Amen. And he's called the last Adam because we're not going to need another one. He fixed it. Hallelujah. So just real quick, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, that's Adam, death reigned by one. Where did all this death come from? I, I'm not being mean to preachers even. I are one. So I'm not being critical. 
But I recently heard preachers talking about God and how God is, is somehow or another involved in all of this death and all this evil, all this... God didn't bring all this stuff on this planet. God didn't create... God didn't... Praise the Lord. God didn't even create Satan. He created a beautiful angel, Lucifer. And iniquity was found in him. Satan created evil. It was found in him. And that's how he got kicked out of heaven and a number of angels that rebelled against God. The Bible teaches Adam brought sin into the world. Adam, under the divine influence of demonic powers, the devil, brought sickness into the world, poverty into the world, all this evil. Man did this. That's why Jesus, God had to become a man to fix it. A man broke it, not God. And so God becomes a man to fix it. One man, by one man's offense, death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. All the condemnation people labor under came from Adam. And being born into this world and being in Adam. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Think about that. One man, Adam, made us sinners. You were a sinner not because you sinned, even though all have sinned to come short of the glory. It wasn't your personal sin that made you a sinner. It was Adam's sin. Just like it's not your personal holiness that makes you righteous with God now, it's Jesus' righteousness. How did we get into this mess? We got born into it. Everybody born flesh and blood is a mess. Born into sin, guilt, condemnation, death. Once you see how you got into sin and that one man got you in, now you know how to get out of sin. One man can get you out. And just like you were born into sin, you got to get born out. When you get born again, you get born out of sin into righteousness, the very righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Somebody shout. Thank you, Jesus. I wish I had time to really work on this because we all want to blame somebody. That's just Adam. Adam and all of us, we want to blame somebody. It's somebody else's fault. It's always somebody else's fault. It was the woman that you gave me. People don't even realize he really blamed God. It's like, I didn't ask for her. You took a part of me out. Then the woman blamed the snake. I feel sorry for the snake. He didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> Just blame, blame, blame. I get it. I like to blame too. One of the things I can blame my sinful condition on is Adam. But just like I can blame Adam for me being made a sinner, I can praise Jesus for eternity for making me the righteousness of God in Christ. One more scripture and we'll quit. Go to Philippians chapter 1. I can't give you the whole context. I've, I've uh, exasperated my time. I'm grateful for it. I'm going to quit. Philippians 1. Let's start in verse 19 to get some of the context. Paul is in jail unjustly. He's being done very, very wrong. And he says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer, and that the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as, as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be life or death. Now, I wish I could say I'm there. I want to get there. I believe we're all on this path where whether we live or die, 
we live or die to the glory of God. Amen. This man had a revelation of his new identity, not after the flesh, but after Christ, where he literally was facing physical death and really believed, if it's my time, even as a martyr, Jesus is going to be glorified in my body. That, that's just over the top. It's hard to wrap your mind around that. For to me, now look at verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That scripture confused me for years. I didn't get it unpackaged till this journey of the vision. Scripturally, the Holy Spirit opened my... Paul just said, for me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. I taught this one time, second row. I can't remember now if it's now if it's on my left or right. I haven't told this story in so long, but the lady got so mad, she jumped up and stormed out of the church that that man is a false prophet. He just said he was Jesus. Because I turned around and said, for me to live is Christ. For me to die is gain. And she thought, I was saying, I'm God. I don't want to insult you in my closing. I'm too dumb to be God, and you're too smart to think I'm God. So that lady wasn't real bright. But what, what was Paul saying? See, we don't understand how united to Jesus we really, we really are. He says, for me to live. Remember Galatians 2.20. Crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We don't understand that any goodness coming out of us is Jesus. There's no goodness in you, independent of Jesus. Any kindness in your life, it's not you, it's not your flesh, it's Jesus in you. The love of God in my heart has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit. I'm quitting. Years ago, I was making tea. And you take a tea bag and you put it in water. And something happens to the water. It's miraculous. There's like this miracle, this great mystery. This, this uh, fireworks goes off and, and it's just miraculous. The, it changes color and, 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 and it's tea. And, and you take the tea bag out. And you throw the tea bag in the trash can. But what do you call the water? Tea. Oh, wait a minute. No, no, no. The tea is in the trash bag. That's the water. But the tea bag has been so infused into the water. The tea bag is so identified with the water. And the water is so identified with the tea bag, we call the water tea. But none of us are confused. That's the water, that's the tea, but the tea has affected the water, and so we call the water tea. I'm not Jesus. Jesus is not me, but we be tea. <laughs> and the Father God looks down on the body of Christ of different nations. All nations will be gathered together one day. And he looks at us and he says, tea. But then, but then he gets excited sometimes and he goes, sweet tea. When we really do well and we know how to dance. The father goes, sweet tea. I'm not Jesus. Jesus is not me, but he has so infused his spirit into my spirit that we be T. And we're supposed to leave here now and go into that messed up world and not let it affect us. But we need to look at them and say, taste and see that the Lord is good. That the Lord is good. And they are supposed to see something in us that's not flesh, but is a resurrected King of kings and Lord of lords. 
And I just want to say it's been a blessing. And I love you, my pastor friend. And I pray that I've, I've been a blessing to you. Father, thank you for these precious people. Thank you that you look at us and Jesus is at your right hand. But you see us united to him. You see us as his body, the body of Christ. And I just thank you that in this great awakening that's on the horizon that has begun, like Ezekiel saw it, the water came out of the temple and it hit the ankles, then the knees, then the waist. Then it swept them away into your purposes and plans. Thank you that the water is coming out of your house and it has definitely hit the ankles. But let us be faithful and loyal to Jesus where we're apart when it hits our knees. We simply bow to the true and the living God and nothing or no one else. And thank you that it's going to hit our waist, this great awakening. And from our waist, our loins, we produce. We bear fruit. And that the church is going to change the world, not the world, the church. That you will come back for a bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And that she will be mature as she's made herself ready. And that I believe we could be a part of this last awakening where we're just swept into the flow of the Holy Spirit. And that like a flood, it will be irresistible in our culture. And that people will be saved from a devil's hell. I thank you for this church, this seed you've sown. And I pray that it become a tree of righteousness. And that many find refuge here. And blessings under the shadow of the Almighty. Thank you, God, for planting us by rivers of living water, the Holy Spirit. May we blossom and bloom as your people in these last days. And not be intimidated by the enemies of faith. May Christ rise up big against the Antichrist. Because we've read the end of the book. And Christ wins. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen.